corrected after the fact, if you will. Uh, and then there is a, a, a little click at the top right hand corner of the screen um, that uh, shows a, that you can reconfigure the page. So uh, most of the presentation, we'll do a little presentation. Grace and I will speak to the different issues and then um, uh, and then we'll open up for conversation. So when we open up for conversation, we'll go into the meeting mode where you see everybody's face or whatever. Other than that, what's on the screen is largely a, a PowerPoint, but you can also configure it <clears throat> so you can see people's faces. At the moment, I have them along the top of the screen or they can be down the side, depending on how you configure it. Okay, so if you have any questions, uh, put them in the chat box uh, and, uh, and Kate or, or someone will get back to you in terms of trying to help uh, sort it out. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, Okay. All right, so uh, yes, yeah, so there's just an example of a slide. I, I can't even remember which course that is there. That's a course from, I think it was two years ago. Um, uh, one of the facilitation ones, I believe. Um, so anyhow, just uh, inviting everybody to type in your uh, type in your name and your organization and your program or whatever in the chat box so we know who's online. Uh, <clears throat> now to manage the conversation, it looks like we'll be a relatively small group, so I think we should do this. This shouldn't be a big problem. Uh, so uh, between Grace and I, we will manage the conversation. We're asking everybody to keep your your um, your microphones turned off. Uh, when you're, except when you're talking to the group, um, otherwise um, it gets uh, the feedback and the disruption is a little disrupted. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, and if you uh, if you want to make a point or whatever, feel free. I'm in the participant box, there's a little place where you can click um, by your name and, and you raise your hand and it puts your hand up uh, as if you're asking for attention. Or you can uh, you can speak to um, uh, write something in the chat box if you want to contribute at a certain point or have a question. Um, and if you're having any problems, and even if you get whatever, <clears throat> send an email back to uh, to the original email address that you got the notice from. Uh, Kate is also monitoring that email account while we're online. Uh, she's multitasking much better at this than I. And um, and so if you send an e if you get bumped out or you can't be, you have problems, just send us a quick email at womenlead at saintofx.ca, and uh, Kate will respond as best we can. Okay. Um, any questions or anything? Um, all right. Not uh, <clears throat> not hearing anything. Uh, let's move on then. Let's get started. Okay, so I've already introduced myself. Uh, I'm Anthony Scoggins. So who is who's Grace Iraq who's there? Grace, introduce yourself. Yes, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. In Uganda, it's good afternoon. In uh, Canada and uh, Halifax time, it's, uh, it's nine. Uh, Thank you very much for joining this very important conversation. Uh, as a Kodi family and uh, Ugandans getting into this, it is a great opportunity to us. And I thank all the Kodi family for bringing us together. I'm Grace Arach. I work with a Foundation for Women Affected by Conflicts in Northern Uganda. Right now I'm in Northern Uganda and I'm speaking to you just uh, 20 kilometers from South Sudan. And uh, I hope you will be able to get me well, though the network will also still be a problem. Uh, some few people, uh, Thomas uh, sent me his apology that he may not be able to join because he has other commitment. I've not heard from Tom, but uh, most Ugandans are living in the villages. They have own villages because uh, people are trying to avoid town of being in the city. So network and uh, communication may be still a problem, but we, we keep tracking them as they arrive. So uh, once again, I welcome everyone. Okay, thank you very much, Grace. Um, uh, okay, and um, 
uh, let me move on. Let's go to the next slide then, uh, uh, Kate. Oh, okay, I've got to check to see, is Gord, um, is Gord online? I am. You are, okay, Gord, please. Good afternoon, Uganda. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Gord. Well, let me just uh, thank Grace for initiating this and Anthony for uh, pulling us together. Um, this is a, one of a series of webinars and connection points we've had with graduates since COVID-19 began. There's been a number of country-based um, groups, such as this one. There have been some that have been organized around various themes and some that have been organized around constituencies like women. Um, in fact, the very first one we had was was was, was led by our women's center. Um, the, in this very difficult time, and we want to hear more about how you're faring. Um, you know, we we have been challenged, <laughs> uh, but probably not to the extent that you are now seeing it. We are now moving out of the worst part of the curve and are talking about ways of opening up that unfortunately doesn't mean bringing people to campus anytime soon for us, but it does potentially allow us to be uh, moving around more uh, out of a lockdown kind of situation gradually. Um, but we have found that keeping in touch with our graduates uh, this way has been incredibly helpful to us. It's helped boost our morale and spirits because we miss you all. Uh, we want to hear how you're doing. We, we find that these conversations can be cathartic because they allow people even within countries or cohorts to connect with each other. And I guess last but not least, they, they help give us some intelligence um, that, uh, that allow us to really rethink some of the courses that we're planning on offering uh, starting this fall and uh, at least fall in, in, in Canada and to really try to see how we can um, make them more relevant to the moment we're in in terms of a, a, a COVIDian era as I like to call it and moving into a, a new normal and potentially a new world. So um, thank you for all attending and um, thanks again to Grace and Anthony for organizing this and I, I just plan to listen in. And uh, if I have to drop off for any reason because to take a call, I will catch up with the recording. So thanks again, and good to see you all. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you, Gord. Um, so yeah, there, there's a, a very special um, historical connection between um, uh, the Cody Institute and and Uganda, um, and uh, we've always had every year we've always had. Uh, and the institute has been operating for now more than 60 years, have had um, uh, Ugands on campus. We went back to the list, um, the database uh, for this uh, call. Uh, we found that there are almost 300 Ugandans uh, who over the years have, uh, have come here. Um, and uh, uh, one of the very first uh, graduates, um, Father uh, Kibariji, who was with the Catholic Social Commission, I think it was called, or Catholic Secretariat, uh, and was a, a leading light in sort of social development uh, in East Africa, and in particular had a strong connection with the Savings and Credit Cooperative Movement, and who, to be honest, 20-odd uh, years later, I had the honor to meet, um, and throughout the 1980s, um, as I was quite frequently in, um, uh, in uh, uh, Uganda at that, at that time. Uh, as far as I can tell, the first workshop that was done in um, in Uganda, where I, I Cody actually came to the field and worked together, was done in 1981. Um, uh, and uh, we, uh, uh, to be honest, uh, uh, that was me, uh, <laughs> a much younger version of me. So I, it always uh, amuses me when I meet Ugandans um, uh, at Cody or whatever, and, and they say, and they ask me, so I think people like Grace would ask me, so have you ever been to Uganda? And I would have to say, Grace, I was in Uganda before you were in Uganda. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, anyhow, um, uh, so uh, over the years, we've had different uh, partnerships, um, uh, with different Ugandan organizations. At the very beginning, the, the early decades, it was primarily with 
the cooperative organizations, uh, no, notably the Savings and Credit Union and the Cooperative Alliance and some of the larger primary uh, growers cooperatives, um, and also the faith-based agencies, primarily the, the Catholic Church and the Church of Uganda. Certainly at the time, I'm not quite sure where it is all now, had significant development programs, um, training centers, and we did a lot of work building curriculum and training of trainer capacity and so on. In the, in the, in the, in the in more, more recent years or the, in this century, we've actually had a much more diverse uh, group of um, uh, connections with different organizations, uh, smaller NGOs, uh, community-based um, civil society organizations, and have had a lot of really interesting and dynamic uh, people uh, through the Institute, uh, many of which who are on this call. And if I understood correctly, when I saw through the chat box, we even have uh, somebody here who, who isn't a Cody graduate, who, but who aspires to becoming a Cody graduate. <clears throat> so welcome, Lydia. Everybody's, everybody's welcome. So just to say there's been a long and warm uh, history of, um, of, of uh, connection and support uh, between the two institutions, and we hope to carry that forward. Anthony, could I just jump in and add one more thing? Sure. It's Gord here. Um, the, uh, you know, you were the first, <laughs> Cody, uh, Stafford, uh, to do a workshop or, or do something on the ground with Cody in Uganda. I think the most recent was Yogesh Gore in 2015 uh, through a Rockefeller-funded initiative that we did in partnership with Institute for Development Studies in the UK and uh, ADD. Uh, the, uh, the Action for Disability and Development, also based out of the UK, that focused on livelihoods of persons with disabilities uh, in Uganda. And Yogesh was involved both in Kampala and in, in Northern Uganda in a couple of, of research, action research initiatives on the ground with organizations that work with persons with disability. I think that was the most recent. Um, yeah. And in between, there are, are probably lots that we're missing, but... Uh, um, no, Between Anthony and I, we have about 43 or 44 years of, of institutional memory at Cody, so we should be able to track them all, most of them. Okay, all right, that's that. great. I, I learned something new today, so that's great to know, Gord. All right, good. Okay, Kate, let's move on then. Okay, Grace, why don't you uh, introduce what we're, our conversation today? All right. So Grace, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. All right. I was wondering if you want to do the introduction of our conversation today, so. Oh, I'm trying to move my... Okay. All right, I'll, uh, I'll go yeah. ahead with yeah. this one and then... Yeah, and then hang it's, it's okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, go ahead. Yes. Uh, today, I, in our conversation, in this very difficult moment around the world, where the entire world has been shut down with uh, what we call coronavirus or called as COVID-19. In a time of this uh, pandemic, uh, Cody alumni and their organ the organizations are looking for uh, and finding ways to support community of vulnerable and disadvantaged to respond to this crisis. And today, today's conversation is an opportunity for Cody graduates. And uh, as I've said earlier, Uganda should take this opportunity as very important because it will help us to harmonize our, um, harmonize our ideas within and be able to spread it in all parts of Uganda. Uh, this is an opportunity for Cody graduates of Uganda to share ideas and experiences, uh, questions and challenges impacting, of course, how our different communities, organizations that we serve, and uh, how we can respond to these issues. Of course, most of us, or all of us, as Ugandans, we've already been doing so much to ensure that uh, uh, we see how to contain this uh, pandemic in all our families, in our communities, within our country, and 
and even to support the world to deal with this. So this is uh, something, something that uh, we need to get together and please we share and ask questions where possible. Okay, next slide, Kate. All right, so a quick word uh, on the background. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure I didn't, these, these statistics were from the end of last week. Um, hopefully they haven't changed too much, but uh, anyhow, at a global level, um, uh, the, the virus known as COVID-19 uh, found to be highly contagious and particularly uh, dangerous for those with diminished immune systems. So that may be the elderly, those people with pre-existing conditions or tuberculosis or respiratory problems or those people with, um, um, uh, as I people just uh, from malnutrition and other types of uh, systemic problems. So uh, in only a few months, the virus has spread around the world. Uh, officially, uh, the numbers at the moment are uh, 5 million people uh, infected and um, over 300,000 uh, deaths. Uh, and the contagious nature of the virus has prompted a, a shutdown of economic, political, and social life um, uh, around the world uh, with unknown long-term implications, uh, particularly for the poor, the marginalized, and the most vulnerable. So uh, it is not um, unfair to say that in uh, that global, national, and community institutions are all struggling to figure out how to respond to this crisis. So that's at the global level. And Grace, you want to speak to the context of Uganda? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, in Uganda, uh, we, we, we can say at this moment that uh, we cannot celebrate, but uh, we thank each and every Ugandans for taking part in doing their role as far as uh, uh, containing this infection is concerned. Uh, first of all, I request to let everyone know that uh, Uganda re registered its first case of uh, coronavirus in March, uh, which is about uh, within uh, on the 19th or 21st within that time. And at the moment, as I talk, uh, the latest uh, uh, statistic that we have of uh, confirmed cases of coronavirus is uh, 260. And this is uh, a huge number that we should not uh, think that it is something that uh, we should celebrate because every time the number is going up and uh, each and every day that we, we, we see the statistic, we see it uh, going up. And then also issues of recovery, about 55 people have uh, recovered from the illness. And then uh, no death, we thank God. No one has, has yet uh, uh, died of uh, coronavirus. Um, uh, one thing we have to appreciate so much, or we could say we've learned lessons from, is that uh, in containing, and if we see this kind of statistic, we, we, we thank Uganda, is because uh, the state has taken over the awareness creation and uh, the local government, and then task force from Ministry of Health uh, at the forefront in ensuring that this is contained. And we also uh, we reflect back, Uganda suffered Ebola for previously in Northern Uganda and Western Uganda. And this is also one lesson that uh, Uganda um, medic tried to borrow to see how to contain such uh, dangerous uh, uh, illness like uh, Corona. 60% uh, of Ugandans are likely to be dragged deeper into poverty as a result of this pandemic. Uh, as you see, there is total lockdown in the country, though it is gradually being done. Uganda depends mainly on agriculture as its major 
uh, way of uh, generating income, leaving alone other, you know, uh, white color jobs. But agriculture carry almost, uh, you know, 60% or 70% of what we do. So uh, with this uh, COVID-19, we see that uh, mm, poverty is likely to be a major issue in Uganda as a result of this uh, pandemic, because so many people have been laid off from their job. Uh, some of them have just kept on hold. They don't know when they are going to go back to continue with their work. And then secondly, it is anticipated that uh, domestic violence and mental health cases are likely to rise. And as I talk now, I, I have to share with you people that uh, domestic violence has remained on the rise. And issues of mental health is very crucial. Uh, connecting to example in Northern Uganda, which every, every moment we address issues to connect and deal with the past uh, uh, war, uh, we find that uh, issues of mental problem remain a huge problem. And then the total lockdown on fine families who never experienced being together for such a long time. They are just on and off, but this lockdown has made them to always stay together. And in the process of learning one another, you fight full ropes here and there, and that uh, has created a lot of uh, domestic violence in families. And then millions uh, of uh, Ugandans are uh, at risk of losing their job, as I said as the lockdown uh, remain a problem to their, um, their job, especially white colored job. And then uh, if you know very well, Uganda, uh, the young people are mainly engaged in border border. And border border activities have been stopped. Uh, the border borders have to only carry luggage if they can. And if not, they just have to hire their motorcycle and do other work. So this, this makes it so uh, fragile. If young people are not able to access livelihood activities that they're already used uh, into doing. And then another thing that we see is uh, issues of anger and death. Uh, in the rural community, we know uh, people are farming a lot. And when you see the weather this year, it is just very good for agriculture. There's a lot of rain, and most people have gone to their villages to carry out agriculture. But uh, how, how are we going to deal with these food items being produced? Because uh, they will end up uh, in the hand of uh, middlemen who will exploit them and they will not be able to realize all they have to realize uh, as profit from whatever they, they produce. And then another very crucial thing about the uh, context of Uganda as related to this COVID-19 is uh, the, 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 the social life of Uganda, the way Ugandans live. Ugandans are kind of people that you cannot stop from socializing. It is very hard for them, like shaking hand is one thing that uh, Ugandan love so much. And if you don't shake somebody's hand, you, you just fold your hand. Somebody feels like, oh, this person, you know, is having bad manners. But they are trying, Ugandans are trying to cope with this and then to see that uh, it becomes an habit that is not for just its sake, but then it's to protect uh, one another. And then secondly, issues of... Um, uh, Uganda love, Uganda is a country which is um, majority are uh, Christian and they love prayers. Prayers, not individually, people love to pray in groups. And this, when this corona came in, it was very difficult for people to really see that, to come into terms with uh, being in your house and praying alone or pr praying online. So this, I think that uh, Ugandans find it very difficult. And when you lose loved ones, of course, experience of Ebola has also told us or taught us that uh, funeral rites has to, or burial has to be celebrated. And this, I think that uh, to a country that uh, has this kind of social life makes it very hard for it to 
contain things like uh, contagious uh, diseases. Um, and also the world at large know that Uganda is hosting the, the, the largest number of refugees. And uh, most part of Ugandans are, uh, are hosting these refugees. Northern Uganda has, Western Uganda has, and uh, about 1.4 million refugees are in Uganda. And these ones are from uh, Congo, South Sudan, and uh, some of them from Burundi. So dealing with this uh, 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 pandemic and looking at Uganda dealing also seeing that its people are protected and including refugees who have uh, escaped war from their countries become a huge issue for Ugandans to deal with or the country to deal with because you need to protect the border. Uganda is still a landlocked country that depend on the border, you know, trips uh, or transport to bring things in, in, in inside. So this has made it also difficult for Uganda to contain the, the spread of this virus because in, in within, as we get the information, there is no um, much case of coronavirus other than the border one. And then also what is uh, very crucial to know is that uh, the government is working hard to ensure that there should be uh, a control line of communication about uh, this uh, spread of corona, not just uh, uh, letting people talk about it anyhow, because a lot of uh, misinformation have been coming in. And uh, as human beings, even me, some of them, I, I almost believe. But then when you go, for an elite, elite person, you, you're able to go online, read things, and again, get uh, authentic website and uh, uh, counter proof. So for a, a deep rooted person there who has never, who does not know how to read and write and confine in his or her home, get such an information from radio or from television, that would that creates a lot of um, tension in the country and then in the community. That makes it hard to deal with the situation. So this is being dealt with, of course, by the government. And I appreciate Ugandans uh, for being very supportive. It, was, it has not been a one-man uh, achievement, but all Ugandans have, have participated or played a role in ensuring that uh, this is dealt with. And uh, with the with this pandemic, uh, there is a there is a there is a one thing that the government is trying to do, but remains a challenge. That is uh, issues of uh, diseases that already existed in Uganda before the COVID nineteen. So the confinement or the lockdown, as uh, somebody would say has created negligence in ensuring that uh, those other diseases or, or the, the chronic illnesses that uh, we already have in Uganda be dealt with. Example, HIV AIDS, malaria, which is a, a very serious issue. Uh, every day, uh, children in Uganda die of malaria over 19% of Uganda children die of malaria. So these are um, illnesses that need also proper attention to because if we don't pay attention to it, we will realize that the number of people who are dying because of uh, these other illnesses may be greater than the COVID-19 that we think we are trying to prevent from getting spread in the community and killing more people. So this is one area that uh, need a lot of uh, uh, consultation uh, to see how best uh, it can be dealt with. And then uh, matern maternal and child mortality rate, which of course remain an issue because um, women, wants to make, women have to deliver by all means. Women who are pregnant who have complicated issues need to reach hospital. But there are others who live in hard to reach community. That vehicle cannot even enter through. 
border border may not even enter th through. So how can these other people uh, be reached so that they also get uh, the, 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 the attention or medical support that they have to. And um, um, yeah, I think uh, this is a major thing that I feel I should highlight about uh, Uganda and how we are faring. But if there is anything that I, I can add after, I will be happy to. And I still say that uh, for us who are in Uganda, uh, Ugandans who are doing beautiful things out there, let's uh, have this opportunity to share and also let's utilize it and we make it not be just uh, today's conversation, but a conversation that helps us every day in our respective areas. Thank you. Oh, thank you, uh, Greg. That was a, a terrific overview uh, of the uh, of the complicated uh, situation um, that the pandemic has created in uh, Uganda. Uh, very comprehensive. Uh, thank you for that. So uh, that's basically all of the talking that Grace and I want to do. Really now we want to hand it over um, to the participants on the call to speak to um, what we thought were the two key questions. Um, the first question is uh, just basically, so what has been the impact of COVID-19 on your community or your organization? And, and secondly, how are you responding? And is it a community-based response? How are you working with communities to respond to the pandemic? So um, uh, those are the two uh, main questions we'd like to discuss and we just uh, run quickly through. Another, there are different dimensions to these questions. All right, uh, Kate, next slide, please. There's a bit of a lag on the slide uh, switch. So can you go to the next slide? Is it, is it going to go? There we go. So there's the issue around uh, community engagement. So for example, those of us who work with and in communities, how can we support um, communities through public awareness and education or uh, health and sanitation and well-being, uh, food security, uh, economic livelihoods, and, uh, and more. So what are the ways we can support uh, communities um, uh, through uh, mobilization and engagement. Okay, next slide. Over to you, Grace. Yeah. Uh... I think this is one area that we need to now uh, get uh, into and discuss as a Ugandan team. Uh, how are we engaged with and respond to vulnerable and uh, those who are underrepresented? Like uh, we have the women, we have the children, we have the age, we have persons with disability, and then uh, they economically marginalized. Uh, as I said, uh, mentioned earlier, uh, can I can I first uh, bring in something a little before others can join? Uh, yeah, let's run through the let's run through the questions and come back because I'd like to get off the screen the PowerPoint and then we can set it up so we can see everybody. So, uh, okay. Kate, you go to the next slide. Um, there's just a couple more slides. Um, All right. Uh, okay, can we go to the next one? Uh, okay, so there's also a, a questions around a learning agenda. I mean, this is a very unique moment. And so what is it, uh, what are the types of uh, questions we should be asking or the things we should be learning uh, as part of our pandemic response? I know that Uganda has had the experience from the Ebola and then also uh, very significant the HIV AIDS. These are all different types of health crises, but how do we learn each time? What are the things that we should be asking and learning from the crisis? Next slide. Uh, Kate, can we go to the next slide? There we go. Okay. Um, Grace, do you want to speak to this or? 
Yeah. Um, on influencing public policy, what are ways? What ways can we CBOs and NGO try uh, to ensure that uh, we engage with uh, with uh, one another and influence the major policy issues or decision that are currently being made by the government and duty bearers in response to the COVID-19. Okay, thank you. So uh, that's another uh, agenda that uh, different uh, partners, and if we want to look outside Uganda, I can share some of the stories from others. And then finally, there's the, the question about our own organizations. Uh, what uh, extent are, is this lockdown and the freeze of the program uh, face uh, challenging our own sustainability as organizations. You know, for example, Cody is facing a really big issue. If we have to go for a year without any international participants coming to anti Ganesh, so how, what do we do for our programs? Uh, you know, what do we do for our funding? Um, so uh, I, one of the questions is not just about the community or about government. It's also about, um, uh, it's also about, um, uh, our own organizational needs. Okay, next. Next slide, please. All right, so uh, this is where the point where those were just some of the questions we thought were of relevance. How do we engage with the community? How do we uh, focus on the most vulnerable? Uh, how do we engage in policy? How do we engage in research and learning? And what does it all mean for ourselves? So this is, this is just a, a general set of questions we thought were interest. Now we would like to open the floor to conversation. I will hand it over to Grace, who will uh, uh, facilitate the conversation, but you should feel free to uh, raise your hand um, uh, or wave on the screen if you've got video uh, or put a comment in the chat box. All right, so sorry that we're already losing uh, uh, Christine. So here we go, all right. So we've now gone over to the, uh, the gallery view. Um, so I'll hand it back to Grace. Why don't you start off with some comments from your own experience, and then and then let's open the floor. Yeah. Um, to end something a little bit on uh, how before others uh, could come in and also bring in more. Uh, as for work, uh, for work, uh, work mainly with uh, women, girls, and children who have been affected uh, by conflicts, conflicts in society, in families, and uh, war. These are key things that we see, and the the, the dynamics of all these uh, make for work an holistic organization that deals with various community issues that. Uh, uh, escalate conflicts and how they can be dealt with. I just first of all want to to appreciate the opportunity that I was in Cody to have the six months uh, course in uh, development leadership because immediately I came back I started joining hand with uh, my staff to ensure that uh, we get into trying to implement and practice uh, key community sustainability uh, ideas that we got from the, the brilliant mind at the university and also among the students who participated. So when the COVID-19 pandemic uh, came in, um, people were running up and down to see how to to, to change their, 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 their program strategies and all that we had already put a lot in place. And uh, all that we were working towards sustainability. So uh, our plan for sustainability in our programming was directly, uh, has directly become a, a program for COVID-19, how to deal with uh, the COVID-19 in how, in, in, in the way we program and deliver our program. For work, uh, train about uh, eight uh, community resource persons, or we call it community volunteers who are currently based 
in the sub counties that the two districts we work in and the key sub counties that we work in. And during this period, we have realized that uh, they are doing tremendous, tremendous work because uh, the training that we gave them in psychosocial counseling is helping them now to get into the community, support families who are affected by domestic violence and uh, any other issues that gets arising in the community that they are able to. So uh, every time what we've, we've done since we, can, we were not able to move to community at uh, when this lockdown just started, we, we used to have airtime and distribute to key leaders in the villages. We, this time we took uh, villages, uh, village by village that we have at least a representative whose role is mainly to connect other, to other group members or community and uh, report cases. Every day we are reporting cases and how if a woman needs support or has a complication that cannot reach the, the hospital, we try to link with to ensure that uh, this person is taken to the hospital. And then secondly, our programming also has gone towards um, uh, the course that we did uh, with God, God and uh, that is, uh, uh, is it asset-based community development? Uh, what we're doing, we have started identifying local available resources that community can, can, can utilize them and turn into income generating activities. And uh, this is, is really working because uh, there is a lot that we have in the community that our community, uh, our our, our people can exploit to ensure that uh, they, are, they get into doing something that is productive uh, to, to them. And then working with the vulnerable persons, we, among the groups that we have, and not only the groups in the community, we have identified persons with disability, and especially those ones who are not able to listen, those ones who are not able even to hear. So we have identified in the different locations of uh, people who knows how to use sign language and communicate to these categories so that they are able to get and to understand what is going on. Because just uh, one month ago, one of a person with disability got into problem. He was found roaming on the street well, at the time when people were supposed to be in the lockdown down, I mean, inside their home, and uh, he was just shot and killed. So these are things that uh, if we don't handle well, persons with uh, people, those who need uh, people with special needs can get into a serious problem compared to us. And then also, uh, we have created uh, a forum within our networks of organization dealing with sexual gender-based violence. And uh, we, we are reaching all areas to ensure that we teach community on hand washing and uh, also provide them because there are other vulnerable families who are not able to provide that. And uh, for workers and organization, uh, I, we've started the Catherine Fleming. And one of the best, the basic knowledge that they have learned is making making the, the first mass. So they are making this first mass and distributing to, to, to individuals or you know, people who are not able to afford so that they are able to move in town or in public places freely. So this has helped a lot in you know, ensuring that we get involved. And then the issue of unwashing, we've been trying as much as possible to ensure that um, community accept this. But to those who benefited from the key programs that we deliver, it is not something new. It is something that they already uh, uh, they were already practicing, and by adding into the, onto this, made them more committed and supportive into to, to carry out the role of the task force. Uh, when we talk about task force, sometimes we think that those who are at the national level are the greatest. Uh, task force, but uh, 
for me, I look at these ones at the grassroots who are taking the front line in, in reaching households and uh, teaching them on how to use the face mask, how to wash their hands. Sometimes they laugh and say, how do you even teach us how to wash our hands? And we realize with this pandemic that our people, including maybe me, I don't know how to wash my hands. Some people would just wash like this and it's gone. So we realize that you, that is not how to wash. Today we have come to teach you how to wash and they laugh. And then we say, when you wash, you know, this is how you should do it. And it becomes very interesting and they get to know that this is not something simple we need to follow. So uh, that is the few I can share at the moment and uh, I welcome any other Ugandan. I can see Joyce. Joyce, how are you? <laughs> Very fine, thank you, Grace. Um, hello, everybody. Hello, everyone. Hello, we can hear you. It's good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm actually not very far from where Grace is because currently I am in, uh, in Kitkum Town, Grace. And uh, I, I came down yesterday from Kampala, so, but don't get scared. I am safe. <laughs> um, I begin by saying that uh, uh, I'm, I'm really very, very grateful to be a part of the discussion and uh, to see that, uh, yeah, we put heads and thoughts together to ensure that we support communities and uh, make development processes go on amidst the pandemic. I work for an agricultural program and uh, the program targets both the Uganda national population and the population of the refugees, mainly from South Sudan. And uh, the program is covering um, about 12 districts. And I can straight up tell you that we have been so overly delayed <laughs> by what is happening. And yet we need to keep the contacts and our service delivery going on, especially that we are working with communities that derive their livelihoods from agriculture. So from when the case was first you know, reported about and eventually all these measures that the government of Uganda put in place were implemented, you know, we've been trying to engage within our cohorts, engage within our networks to discuss on how we can continue, um, you know, to keep the farmers running amidst the pandemic. And, and so we've had a number of, of, of suggestions uh, of, for continuity and seeing that, uh, you know, we don't just leave the farmers hanging or leave the refugees hanging. So maybe I'll just quickly say a few things on, you know, some of the, 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 the issues that we took up as, uh, as our agency and also as uh, what we've tried to recommend for the partners that we fund and are really, you know, having a one-on-one -on -one with the farmers at all times. Maybe I'll quickly run through that and then I may leave the meeting because I am here actually delivering a training. <laughs> For, for staff that are working with the farming communities themselves, the frontline staff. So if you see me running away, Anthony and Grace, it's because I'm running back to, to see that the groups are actually, are actually going on with the training. Now, the first thing that we had to do was replan. You know, the farming systems that we support are actually rain fed meaning that you cannot afford to lose a week or two or something of the sort. And so we had to sort of reprioritize what we saw from our work plans, what needed to be delivered and what we could jump <laughs> to ensure that there's, there's, all we were running forward is seeds delivered on time and farmers are able to put the seeds on the ground or in the ground. 
and uh, some other things we're supposed to follow through later on. So we had to look through our programs and try to prioritize which ones would enable, would not um, stop the delivery of inputs to the communities. We did that. And uh, also within our programs, the biggest thing that we do is actually extension service delivery. And the, the teams that we are working with now uh, are teams that have to train these communities on farming practices. What we're doing is called Climate Smart Agriculture. And so with Climate Smart Agriculture, again, if you are running after the rain, it means you're not smart. So we, 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 we had to sort of try to, you know, redo a lot of things and make those that will not delay processes within the communities to, to run on, to come as before and the rest of the things will, will come in much later on. Now, the government of Uganda, of course, announced some essential sectors that needed to go on amidst the lockdown, amidst all these things. Good enough, the way the policies are being implemented from the capital is a little bit different from how it is being implemented in the countryside. And the president was very clear in saying the farmers should continue with their activities. And so they passed out what they are calling standard operation procedures that, you know, it's detailing how each and every sector is supposed to deliver, especially within the livelihood sector, you know, the rules and regulations of playing the game to ensure that you don't really um, spread the virus or put people at risk or put this. So in the communities, you see people meeting like four instead of 30. Our partners work with communities that are set up in groups of 30. So now you see meetings targeting groups in four, uh, smaller numbers and all this and all this. And that is also still to ensure that we sort of don't give a risk to the communities because this extension, people come from the town, the urban centers and go into the communities. And so operating under the, the SOPs, we've seen quite some work going on uh, in the communities. The farmers are going to their farmlands and uh, uh, they are trying to, you know, they are also listening by the way I thank the government because there's quite some awareness that is happening in the communities. People listen to the radios, um, people listen from their local leaders, the LCs and the sub-county leaders because the president was like, if you look at any foreigner coming in, it is the responsibility of the LC ones to actually safeguard the communities. So whenever they pass out uh, some kind of communication, they, the communities receive with 10 hands and they're trying to be vigilant with that. Also extension service, like I said, for the most we were doing, you know, face to face with the groups that we had to now upscale our, our radio uh, sensitization programs. As a matter of fact, the teams had to sit down and, you know, redo you, you, their plans to make sure that it's also incorporating a little bit of how we can survive through the pandemic and uh, without necessarily leaving essential departments within farming homes really going idle. So we, we've had a lot of online session, I mean on radio sessions talking about what is happening uh, now and how the farmers can carry on with their farming and all this and all this. In some cases, we've also involved people from the districts and also the, the, the leaders at the sub-county level really to sit with our teams here and then pass on the messages to the farming community. So it's, it's quite alive, it's quite vibrant. You hear a lot of calls, they receive a lot of feedback um, from these teams, uh, I mean, from the communities. And it is all to say, extension service delivery should go on, uh, but in a different modality. So we, we are happy that it's actually working on very well. Now, we, with the refugees, it's been, Interesting, um, you know, the biggest, the biggest um, uh, agency that is working for and working with the refugees to ensure they get their food is WFP, World Food Program. And what happened was within us is that they, I think they saw that maybe because of the lockdown, there would be some kind of redundancy 
with our teams since they're limited in terms of you know, going frequently to the community. So they requested for a partnership with us because for them, with or without the pandemic, operating under the SOPs, they still needed to deliver food to the refugees. So they partnered with uh, you know, our teams, the Nuri teams, and uh, came up with kind of a working schedule that during the period that um, you know, the lockdown was quite severe, they asked for our staff to be trained by them. And uh, after the training, they were still supposed to support their teams in delivery of, of, of food items and other essential things to the refugee communities. And that partnership is actually still working. So instead of our guys sitting in the offices and waiting for come what may, <laughs> a number of them under precaution, under strict measures and other this, under the SOPs have actually supported WFP so very much in the refugee settlement up in the north in ensuring that delivery of services is continuing and it is not stopped. Last week, there was quite a violent uh, crisis. There was a, a conflict in one of the districts. And remember with the refugees, there, there, there are two tribes that are always fighting. It's not common here in Dacholi, but it is common up I mean, in West Nile, there are two tribes that are always fighting. And usually when they fight, they start from Uganda and it extends into South Sudan. <laughs> it can just start with two people and then it goes on. And uh, to, to some extent, our staff were withdrawn because it became very, very bad and it caused actually death. And they're still trying to, you know, investigate where that is coming from. So. There is the SOP that the government of Uganda has implemented, but there is also what the WFP has in place that is supposed to protect people that are helping them to deliver services amidst the pandemic. And um, there's, there's training with a lot of care when it comes to the refugee population. Uh, but however, even amidst these challenges, we have still been able to carry across the agenda of the program we've still been able to support the communities now this week the focus is on you know how now everything is supposed to be leveled down and them receiving inputs actually some groups have already begun receiving inputs in terms of seeds and tools and something like that so we are in principle operating under the soaps but we've had to replan uh, and prioritize our, our activities and then we've done so much online, so much on radio, so much on Zoom. <laughs> At the point we were running our meetings actually on Zoom, asking for contributions from every staff, every staff especially the, those in the management teams, we've been able to gather a lot of ideas for them. Now, maybe to wrap it up, there is quite some big implication of all of this, really, to or I mean on the livelihoods of Ugandans up in the north. I want to speak for Ugandans up in the north because I've not been to the west, to the south and all this, although I reside in the capital, but I am very, very frequent up in the north because in as much as I am saying, yes, we can see some deliveries going on in terms of inputs and all this, many people who were doing a lot of smaller small scale income generating activities from the townships have had to shift to the villages and people have opened up very vast pieces of land and all that and all that but the inputs are not there because even the service providers for the inputs are fearing or are afraid of you know coming and traveling amidst this because of the virus so the very little that some agencies are able to you know, give out cannot or will not satisfy the farming needs of the people of Northern Uganda. So there is a likelihood that we will really, really have uh, serious issues to do with food security in a couple of months. Already some, for some crop species, they are late because the service providers for inputs are unable to deliver uh, on time. A few are coming in, but some essential um, uh, crop varieties, you don't see them and that is already not good. What is done in the first season rains, 
uh, includes some of the, you know, like the, the very, very important food, food for the northerners. We're supposed to be seeing some cassava, we're supposed to be seeing some finger millet, we're supposed to be seeing some sorghum and all this. And now if the inputs are not there, now if, this, if we get into the second season rain and uh, with no change, we are likely to face some serious issues. I, I have to say, we are likely to, say, to face some serious issues. Now it's also forcing the communities to buy very poor inputs for those few that can afford, you know, uh, well, how can I call it? Some of them are called home save seeds or whatsoever, whose yields are not very good and all this and all that. So all these dynamics are, are going to set in and uh, we are trying to also replan in such a way that uh, if our fund bracket so allows, maybe we'll have, we'll have to, to, to do double what we should have done in the first season, then do it in the second season and all these things. So it's about you know, looking into and trying to reorganize and cope with, uh, with the current situation. So the North, which supplies so many parts of the country with food, might actually have issues. We are also battling the, uh, the pandemic, but we have not yet solved the question of locusts. So the farmers are hearing COVID-19. The farmers are also fearing the locusts. Actually, in some districts like Agago Grace, they say those that came in the first in the first time are now the eggs are getting into real locusts. And you know that is happening at a time that those that managed to put some little bits in the ground, the locusts will have to eat them. So there is that which we are going to. So these two things are are not nice, are not nice to speak about. And uh, I fear that uh, if, if, if nothing really drastic happens within this period, then we are, we are, we are in for real big time issues uh, in the long time. And the implication for, you know, if the nationals are not producing enough, it means there will also be very little to support the refugees in some parts because the food ratio by WFP is, not, is never enough. And they try to, you know, it's the nationals that try to jump in time and again to support them, to help them. And if they don't have enough, that is another fear that we are, we are having. So in principle, I can say in our agency or within Nuri and Danida, we've tried to replan, we've tried to, you know, carry on in a way that that, that does not let the farmers feel like they're abandoned or they're hanging or something of the sort. The training that we are doing today is actually to enable these people capture data that we need from these communities uh, minus causing trouble or you know creating risks and all this so but other than that Ugandans are happy <laughs> amidst the okay. pandemic. And uh, when I left Kampala, I mean, people are trying to observe uh, mm. what the president has put in place, uh, staying away, uh, some social distance rules being uh, noticed. You don't see border borders anyhow. I learned how to walk very many kilometers because I had to park my car, <laughs> which was nice. I shared it off some weight. So this yeah, is Uganda, Uganda. and yeah. uh, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, Joyce, before you, you go away, uh, you said you, will, you may be, you, you're likely to leave the meeting, but yeah. also you've highlighted so much uh, in line with uh, agriculture, which is the, the backbone of Uganda and people in Northern region. So what, what, uh, what can you share with us in relation to policy ideas that should guide our people, especially when it comes to sale of their products? How, how are you going to, uh, how, uh, how do you see this uh, coming when the crops uh, get ready and ready to sell so that uh, our community are not exploited, so that they are able to earn something and then also enrich their local economy. 
Okay. Thanks very much, Grace. Uh, Nuri has a component of uh, marketing and uh, which marketing that the program promotes is, uh, is called collective marketing, uh, where we are encouraging communities not to sell individually because when you sell as a group, you have better bargaining power, you're, you're able to attract the big buyers and all this and so forth. However, before the pandemic, um, the program is working with what is called a strategic crop approach. And it is actually something that we've been working with under Danida for the last, since 2014. Meaning instead of doing blankets support, every crop, everything, you know, support, no. We did a market analysis and sort of identified what we call the money making crops. Uh, or crops that have high value within the regions, within the districts that we are working with. And we involved the large players in the region in our meetings when we were trying to pass out these crops together with the district uh, production department. So we've, we've, we've engaged people like Mukwano, Grace, you know, Mukwano group of companies that is so much interested in oil, oil seeds and all that. There are other, you know, companies like Gadik and all this and so forth in our meetings. Now, down in the communities, every farming group has a, product, a, 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 a production marketing committee, which is usually having a team of three in each group. And their main responsibility actually is linking up with a staff with you know, the, the, the partners that we support, that we, we, we employed as marketing coordinators. It's about linking up with them and finding out where the key buyers are located. And then a linkage is created in such a way that these groups, when their crops are ready, uh, they bulk in a common place that is easy for the, you know, for the buyer to come in. Of course, not every buyer is going to be able to move into all the villages. So what I can say is that uh, we had a very good success story to share about sunflower, for instance. Actually, the crops that are very successful in terms of collective marketing with the large buyers are sunflower, are sesame, and then we had soybeans. Now we are moving a little, we're seeing a bit of beans also and maybe maize, but sunflower, sesame, and soybeans have been very, very good market oriented like crops and the buyers usually once you bulk and they're linked up it's not it has not been difficult to get these people ready so within the program now even under this COVID that's why we are hurrying to deliver the seeds so that they are never late with the buyers when the time t comes these guys of course will work with their committees and then link up with the marketing coordinators within us here and then link up with the buyers and they should be able as long as they are operating within the SOPs or the standard operating procedures. What we want to carry forward is this. In giving the inputs, of course, we've, we've distributed in such a way that you observe the, the SOPs. For instance, you stack what is supposed to be given for a household here, and then you give distance in between where you align all these inputs that are supposed to go with them. And the, and the staff are not there to hand in physically because People are, the things are leveled and that contact is supposed to be minimized. Now we want to marry, I mean, to carry from the learnings from what we've done during the distribution of inputs process and also carry along when the time for marketing comes, especially in the bulking centers and all this and so forth. I think if the situation continues the way it is, then we are still going to be able to tell the farmers to market under soaps so that, you know, we are not, uh, we are not putting them at a risk. But time and again, we give them marketing information on these radios. This is how much SimSim is going for. This is how much soya bean is going for and all that and all that. All we need to pray for is that they get the inputs, put them on ground in time, and then they market uh, what the big buyers are interested in. Yeah. Thank you so much, Joyce, for yeah, very detailed contribution. Uh, do we have, uh, whom do we have to get 
on board. I don't see anyone raising hand. I must admit, uh, er Erica has had a lot to say in the chat box. Do we want to give him an opportunity to? Uh, yes, yes, please. Yes, please. Hello? Let me just check here. All right. Uh, I just want to, Erican, uh, uh, Mr. Toriyama, uh, are you able to uh, turn off your mic and just say you've written a lot in the chat box? I'm wondering if uh, if you're in a position that you can uh, share some of that orally, if your microphone is working. I'm wondering, uh, can you turn off his uh, turn on his microphone? Are you able to do that from the Hello. Hello, Eric. Speak. Uh, yes. Go ahead and speak. Hello. Hello. Yeah, this is Rukana from Kavale in Uganda, South Sudan of Uganda. I'm sorry that I was not able to catch in because of the network problem. I was not able to join, but at least I. I I used the chat. I was able to write some things on the chat, and so you'll be able to check through and get some of my points. Hello. Yes, we are we are hearing you loud and clear. Yes. Yeah. Uh, some of the things I was able to get, but uh, because I was on and off, I, I I got lost a little bit somewhere in the middle. But at least I've been able to jot down some of the things that I wanted to give within the meeting. Yeah, I hope uh, uh, you're going to check through and then see. Yes, please. Uh, yes, Eric, and you, you made some uh, following on from uh, the previous conversation. You made some interesting comments about uh, the challenges around markets, uh, particularly. Yeah. Uh, small farmers and producers, and that you know, they have, uh, at least in uh, in the south, uh, they have produce that's uh, ready to go to market. But because the the government has closed um, uh, many local markets because of you know concern about social distancing and the like, that in fact uh, on one side people are going hungry, they can't buy the food, and then secondly. Uh, producers who have the food uh, and sell it be just sitting at home and, and rotting or whatever. So uh, that's a particular issue that's, uh, that's been experienced quite uh, widely around the world. And, um, there are different ways that people have tried to respond to it by having, uh, you know, uh, not doing a collective market, not, uh, you know, to doing home delivery, if you will, um, um, to having, uh, to using uh, uh, cell phones or other ways of connecting between consumers and producers so that people don't have to gather in large groups. Um, I don't know if there's any other experiences in Uganda, but I, it is a, um, as, as we've heard, production can, and inputs can be a big problem, but also even if you have the produce, so can uh, marketing, um, uh, particularly just in local markets, uh, never mind, um, you know, having bulk sales through um, uh, buyers, just the, the local markets of uh, producers and consumers. So I don't know if anybody else has anything to say on that, but I think that's a pretty, pretty central issue, uh, that a challenge that people are facing. Hello? Yep, that's all I had to say, uh, <laughs> Grace. I don't know if if there are others who want to volunteer from their experience, uh, there's been uh, you know some conversation in the chat box. I don't know if other people want to contribute um, uh, something in terms of what their organization is doing, uh, whether it relates to what we've already discussed or whether it's something new or different. Joseph, do you have something? Carol? <laughs> yeah. Hi, everyone. Let me just turn Hello. on the video. Yes, please. Okay. Um, I'm trying to turn on the video. 
Okay, so um, hello everyone. My name is Caroline Joan Oyela. I am an, a proud alumni of uh, 2019 um, in the class of uh, promoting accountable democracies with Julian and Carmen. So um, I work for an international organization and uh, supporting government to strengthen their systems um, to, for improved service delivery. And um, in the wake of the COVID-19, we have had to redirect our interventions to supporting um, the government of Uganda to respond to, to the pandemic. Um, in particular, we are um, supporting the task forces, um, especially at the sub-local government level. So we have over 100, and, uh, 100 local governments in, in Uganda, um, but we are supporting 25 of the local governments, um, task forces to be able to, to trace um, for, for, for cases, to be able to manage the cases um, that they have. So in particular, we are supporting um, the coordination of these, uh, of the task forces. And we are also supporting um, awareness, increased awareness um, of the community, especially um, on issues to do with um, the COVID, uh, to be more aware of the COVID. Um, using the presidential directives that are given to us from time to time, um, using um, the Ministry of uh, Health guidelines strictly because um, there have been, as Grace said earlier, there have been so many um, misinformation that has been going into the community. Um, at one point, I think when the COVID had just started, um, the community um, in some parts where my mother is, they were informed that um, this is uh, an evil, um, an evil disease, and they could use cultural means and and just drive the evil away. So, for us in the organization, the awareness creation is um, very important. So we are supporting the task forces uh, with radio talk shows where um, the leaders go on the radio to sensitize the community and the community have a time to for call in. And so there is um, communication on both sides. The community is able to, to talk and tell the the leaders, their fears, and what they are going through in terms of uh, the COVID, and the leaders are able to give them appropriate responses. We are also supporting um, the, the loop from the community to the local leaders, then from the district local leaders. How does information go to the central government, to the Ministry of Health? There are issues that the, the, cent the, the local governments may not be able to answer, so they have to send it to the central government, to the Ministry of Health, um, to provide uh, policy guidelines for, for them to... So, um, best that is how we are trying to to work amidst this virus um, we are at home all our regional offices have been closed we are working from home it's really hard to work with the local governments from home sometimes you want to sit together and you know and provide guide guidelines but you can't so but that's what we are we are doing right now as, as an organization. And uh, also in the country, apart from the COVID-19, uh, with the increasing rainfalls, um, the country has been facing a lot of uh, flooding and many people's homes have been washed. So just imagine people are at home, you're not working. Um, you have no food, and then 
your home is flooded, you have to get out and move out. Um, in our district in the West, in Kasese district, a whole hospital I think has had to be relocated because um, it's, uh, the, the hospital is located in the lowland and um, big rocks and a lot of the flooding of a lot of the water washed the whole hospital out of um, out of the way so it's just not COVID um, we also have the flooding um, of of the country so um, just to also contribute to um, what um, what's his name um, the one from uh, Erican Eric okay. has also been putting out a lot of issues on uh, on the chat. He's talked about the curfew. Uh, we are in a curfew from 7, 7 p.m. to 6.30 in the morning, which is also presenting um, a challenge to, to the people, because even those who go to the market, you have to really be rushing home. So the curfew doesn't catch you, and uh, the local defense units don't grab you, you don't want to be grabbed during that time. Um, in Kampala, there is also no uh, public transport. Private transport is not allowed, only essential vehicles and cargo vehicles are allowed to move. Um, presenting a lot of issues, as Grace said, um, you want to go to the hospital, you really can't go to the hospital because you have to walk and you can't walk because you're really weak and the process of getting um, permission to, to, get, to get transport to take you to the hospital is uh, really also very long. So our mothers and children are having to really um, suffer at home. Um, then the COVID and the lockdown, especially um, many local businesses have had to be closed down. Um, our mothers who have been uh, selling in the local markets, for example, have to stay home um, and there's no food to feed the family. So the government had um, started a food distribution within Kampala, especially for, for such families uh, who, who used to work in the markets, um, border border riders, for example, people who really were earning from uh, hand to mouth, for, let me say that, they are really uh, having a, a very, very hard time um, with this lockdown and, and, and the COVID-19. Um, the president is trying to relax um, a bit, but it's still really not yet, um, up to speed and helping um, the community to get back to getting some livelihoods for themselves. So um, for me, those are some of the challenges that um, we face as a, as a community uh, because of this COVID-19. Uh, and in a nutshell, yes, we are trying to work from home. It's really very hard. We're trying to support the government. We're trying to support the local governments, but it's, it's, it's really hard um, doing this. So um, thank you. That's my submission. In case there are any questions, yeah, thank you. Yeah, Carol, thank you very much for your comprehensive contribution. Um, can we have other, uh, Hanifa has left. And uh, Janet, is Janet in? All right. Hello. Hello. Hello, everybody. Uh, Hello. Hello. Yeah, nice to be part of the discussion. This. Hello. Hello, hello, hello. I have uh, Ellen, yes, and then there, yes, there was uh, Ellen. Can you finish? There, can you start? And uh, after you finish, then uh, who? Oh, yeah, Ellen, go ahead. 
Well, thank you so much, Grace, for hosting us to this forum and for the CODI program in general. I'm a graduate of 2010, together with Erica. I was with Erica in the same class, uh, same diploma class. And uh, today, it's, it's actually a challenge. You have all made uh, great contributions to the discussion. Thank you for that. Uh, I'm going to speak about children because I work for a child-focused organization in uh, rural Tororo district that is in eastern Uganda. And, uh, our main or our vision is to see orphaned children poverty and become positive stewards of their gifts and resources to the glory of God. Or oh, one of the main invest in is education of children. And uh, under, under this period of uh, lockdown, we know that all children are at home. Children are the trees of tomorrow. They are the, the leaders of tomorrow. And uh, they are the people that uh, we, we really have to grow, parent, and see whatever investment we can put in them to have a better tomorrow. Uh, right now, what's happening uh, in my community is there is uh, Grace already talked about uh, an increase in domestic violence. I wouldn't want to repeat that. But also, specifically, some of our children are actually facing abuses, including sexual abuse within the homesteads that they are living in. Actually, a week ago, I was in court and uh, one of our 10 year olds had uh, suffered a, a defilement. And, uh, but we, we thank God the judiciary is working and uh, the culprit was apprehended. And uh, we hope that the child receives justice. During this restriction, it is, uh, there are some services that are hard to come by. For instance, the little girl at this point in time really needs psychosocial support. But Hello, Helen. No private vehicles are not allowed. Uh, but, uh, hello. Hello. Helen, your voice hello. is going a bit down, but it's okay. Continue. Okay, please. So I was talking about uh, the, 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 the restriction creating a problem of access to essential services. It is so, it is so um, unfortunate that uh, social services were one of those characterized under the non-essentials, and yet people need uh, psychosocial support, people need counseling, people need, uh, need all these kind of services that help to, 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 to enhance their emotional and psycho psychological well-being. Uh, so uh, in a nutshell, the restriction actually uh, uh, created an impediment for us who deal directly with communities to be able to offer support in such situations. However, Covenant Masses Uganda has a team, a voluntary team on the ground that have actually been very helpful in, uh, in supporting the households of uh, these children and uh, with counseling and care and uh, and so far we, we 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 have really relied on them to to deliver quality uh, to the households and then the other thing is um, another challenge is uh, coming from the presidential address of yesterday tororo happens to be one of the border towns actually tororo borders kenya to the eastern part of uganda and uh, one of the things is uh, the extension of the lockdown to the 21st of this uh, of, of June has uh, a question it raises because when we are told that schools, especially for candidate, uh, actually candidate classes to resume soon, but uh, Tororo being a district that is at the border also hosts students from the neighboring Kenya. And so opening up, uh, we, we are already looking at this point of uh, resuming school for candidates as 
practical for a district like Ororo. And so we, we actually don't know what government is going to do about that, but it kind of looks like a mix up of, uh, of points uh, coming from uh, the presidential address of, uh, of yesterday. Uh, well, I will, I will uh, put a stop to that for now, Grace. Otherwise, yes. we have done uh, home, deliveries, home deliveries of food, of uh, essential commodities like soap, hand wash, facilities, and all that directly to the households. And we thank God so far, we, uh, Uganda is still uh, doing well, though we cannot still uh, celebrate at this point. So thank you, Grace, for now. Oh, great. Thank you very much, Ellen, for your contribution. I have uh, Nuka. Hello. Yes. Can you unmute? Okay. You hear me now? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Very good. I, I realize I have a namesake. Uh, 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 you know, Joseph. My name is Joseph Unkandu, and I am the executive director of New Cafe. Um, I am uh, an alumnus of, uh, uh, you know, Cody International Institute, and uh, I was there in 2010. I am glad to join you colleagues uh, to discuss a matter of great importance uh, to, to all of us, to the entire world. Uh, basically, when I was uh, at Cody, just a brief background, I pursued advocacy and citizen engagement. And at that time, my immediate aim was, you know, to try to influence government to formulate a national coffee policy which had never been in place before. Just to bring you to speed, in 2013, the government of Uganda formulated the first ever Uganda's national coffee policy a coffee policy that recognizes the fact that smallholder coffee farmers can become masters of their own destiny. And therefore, they are able also to influence other actors in this global value chain to ensure that the power relations, you know, can be balanced such that they can benefit from their own coffee. So that was the essence of me coming to Cody, and we are very, very proud of the knowledge and skills that I was able to acquire from Cody. And coming back to Uganda, I was able to transfer the skills to my colleagues, and collectively, we are able to engage government to have this national coffee policy. Now, the issue that we are discussing today, how it has impacted us, my colleagues have elaborated, but uh, I want to mention just a few things. As a new cafe, an organization of 1.5 million smallholder farmers, an organization that operates along the entire coffee value chain, whereby farmers along the entire value chain own the various enterprises up to a finished product to the cup of coffee. Now with this kind of value chain, both the demand side and the supply side, we have been heavily affected. Just to point out a case in point is Italy is our main destination for our coffee exports. This was among the countries that fell victim of COVID-19 and therefore we got directly affected. 
Of course, even when the lockdown moved on, also in terms of our agility to reach out to the farmers that we had, you know, mobilized into over 200 cooperatives and associations, you know, became a challenge. Having the necessary shipments in time became a, a challenge because the market segment where our buyers of coffee uh, was closed out. We are talking about hotels, we are talking about cafes, we are talking about restaurants. So that is briefly what has happened to us. But to make matters worse, that we have, had, we have just made heavy investments, first of all, in greening the entire value chain, you know, in terms of ensuring that uh, uh, we cater for the environment. We have invested in, in industrial solar. We had just almost finished expanding our warehouses where farmers have got to bulk their coffee. We had just, you know, finished putting up four more factories uh, in, in, outside of Kampala. And that means at a time like this one, it is time to start paying back the money that we borrowed from the bank. Now you are not making shipments, but you are supposed to pay back the money to the financial institutions. So that is then a, 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 another challenge. The other challenge is to do with, um, you know, employees. So I had to uh, ask 90% of my employees to start working from home. I had to reduce 40% uh, per, uh, of their salaries and mine. So you, you can imagine you know, the, the kind of situation where uh, this pandemic has put us. And the worst of all is that farmers' incomes had actually improved by at least 250 percent meaning that if something is not done then farmers are likely to follow back into abject poverty we had improved our value chain in such a way that gender equity mainstreaming had become a no but as you have heard from my colleagues, now households are disintegrating because the household heads cannot really provide enough. So I will not go on and go on mentioning, you know, all the kind of uh, 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 challenges that we are in, but we are trying to look at how do we manage this crisis and more so in, not in terms of short termism. We are trying to look at this challenge in terms of short term, medium term, and long term, because the issue is sustainability. Even if some people are looking at it as if this problem will end in three months, I don't think in order for us to get back to the right footing that we require only that time. Therefore, we are thinking in terms of long term, but we are also bringing this into a larger context because today the world is facing volatility, the world is facing uncertainty, the world is facing you know, complex things, the world is facing you know, ambiguity. Therefore, the question we are asking ourselves, where are we coming from? How have we come to be where we are? Within the coffee value chain, but also overall. And therefore, we are saying we are calling for concerted efforts. There is need, 
a more need for a systems change. We need restoration. We have lost all our values. What is our value system that we need to address? Because we may, we may be lost in COVID-19, but there are more and more challenges. My colleague has talked about locusts. We have floods. We have this disease outbreak. We have migration. We have you know, climate change. We have increased the concentration in global value chains, which you know, really impacts the communities because the communities are always in crisis. It is because this is a global crisis that everyone now appreciates. But the communities of smallholders in most of you know, African countries and many other you know, places have had these serious you know, challenges, which now I, I, I believe that this crisis may be a blessing in this guys that we need to get back to the drawing board for restoration. So such that we don't simply massage this problem, such that we don't look at this problem with the short termism, but rather we look at this and we face it very, very seriously. And therefore this brings me to a point that to say, what is the role of business? Is the principal role of business just to make a profit? The principal role of business should be to solve, you know, societal problems. And that yes, profit is good, but it must not be at the expense of society. And then, we talk about our value system. Then we look at our education system. We need to look at our current generations and future generations. How do we get to these generations to instill a value system that has cognitive empathy, that has compassion, such that when we are to address these, we need to look at the various important sectors that later on the, 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 the world gets back and puts you know, society at the center and a uh, 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 world that needs each other. So I, I, I felt that uh, the, the, this is the contribution for me uh, I, I would share in this because I know Cody you know, is in a position to play a very, very important role in ensuring that you know, a value system that is needed of a human being, that restoration which is, which is require, required, just far, far, far away from simply recovery. We need restoration. We need to reconstruct, you know, a system that looks, you know, for the current, but without compromising the future generations. We need to prepare our future because our future, our children. I submit uh, Grace and Anthony. Thank you. Okay. Hey, thank you very much, Joseph. That was uh, that was quite a quite a presentation, um, and very very insightful, and, and huge huge challenges you've you've thrown onto the table there. Uh, and I, I tend to agree that there aren't just we're we're a little focused on the operational, the immediate issues. How do we deal with this problem or that problem? But this really is a a much bigger question around the the system, and and the opportunity. Is this a moment that we can leverage? Uh, broader and systemic change. Uh, we're getting a little uh, close to the end here. We're, gonna, we're running a little out of time. Uh, Grace, I, I see there's a couple of names, uh, hands up. Um, one is uh, Lydia and one is Juliet. Uh, can we invite them to speak for a couple of minutes and each? And I think I'd, we'd like to wrap up at the top of the hour if possible. All right. Hello. Hi. Hello, this is Lydia. 
Hi, Lydia. Hi, Lydia. Yes, this is Lydia Nalwende. I work with the Minister of Gender, Labor and Social Development. I'm a Senior Community Development Officer. I'm very glad to be part of this meeting today. I'm not a Cody graduate. I have applied before. <laughs> I didn't make it. Hopefully in future, I will. I'm really, I follow the, um, the, the ISCD um, and I follow Code events. So uh, I follow on Facebook and um, I really want to like just um, be on board on, because I, I really love the institution. So um, the Minister of Gender, Labor and Social Development is responsible for labor and also it's things of gender. And um, initially the, 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 the ministry has not been on board as you, you saw that all the supplemental budgets, the ministry was not part of the intervention teams, the task force uh, in full force. So, but however the government put in place these measures to make sure that it stops the prevention because truly we cannot deal with a full blown COVID-19 pandemic. It could break any health system. And uh, the whole, our, our, our sector was initially involved in occupational safety and, and health to ensure that employees had PPE. But when the lockdown came, yeah, now we are handling the issues of job loss. Though the government has been um, discouraging companies on laying down, laying off workers, but this has, um, has been inevitable as, as companies are not making money. So the role, the, the role of the sector has also come um, in light with, with uh, the increase in GPV and increase in vulnerabilities in homes. So currently what is happening is that the, 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 the ministry is collecting data on GBV prevalence in the country and it's, it's doing this data collection online through the district community development officers and also collecting data on, um, on, on companies and employees who have been affected by the pandemic. I surely do not know if they are going to be compensated, but I think it is good for data. We'd like to know how companies have been affected. So this is ongoing. And um, the sector, I'm a social worker, so I felt left out um, in the responses. I, I was not, as a social worker, we were not um, taken as essential, the essential person is personnel. So that is why all this, the GPV is happening and mental issues without like social support. But uh, these are the lessons that we are learning from the interventions. Hopefully for the future, it will be a good lesson that uh, social workers should be on board from the planning phase. And um, there is a population of Ugandans who are non-literate, the, the non-literate population. Over 10 million Ugandans cannot read and write. And these, um, inter these messages given by, by the president and the task force are in English. So there are so many languages spoken in Uganda and um, so these populations that do not speak English cannot, cannot um, take this information right away. They have to wait until it is interpreted for them. And this um, gives a lag in, in how to address the, the pandemic. So hopefully as we take the lessons, uh, we are going to, to, to be brought on board. Recently, the Minister for Youth and Children was in Parliament to to request for money to take off children off the streets, street children, they, they are still on the streets, they are not attended to. And uh, it's, it's, yeah, we are just lucky that uh, they, they, there is no community spread. Otherwise, the issues would, would, would just go overboard. But uh, hopefully the social development sector will be recognized in their role to fight the pandemic. And hopefully the grassroots uh, activities will also reflect the social social work and the social workers will be on board. Those are my submissions. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, Lydia, for your contribution. Uh, Anthony, did you say another person? I can't see another person who is. Yes, Juliet. Go ahead, Juliet. Yeah. Yes, uh, hello, this is Juliet. I work with, I work with Sasakawa Global 2000. It's uh, an international organization. 
which is agriculture. And I relate so well with uh, what Joyce uh, Lokori said and Joseph from Nukafi. What they do is exactly what we do, we do in Sasakawa, and I really commend their work, what they're doing. And on, on addition to that, what we have done, like Sasakawa, we are trying to empower our farmers because, you know, what we've realized when we made, uh, recently we made uh, an online survey to make to get mitigation measures of organization. How is it going to be a continuing organization, not to be depend, not to depend on the good times, but even in the bad times, like right now. So what we noted as a lesson learned, what we got there is that there's too much of uh, a dependency syndrome among the smallholder farmers in the communities. They are, they're always waiting on to the, the, these NGOs, always, they always want a helping hand, but how are, they, how are we going to empower them to sustain themselves as individuals in the communities and also as, in, as a family? How are they going to empower their families to raise their hands and be able to work? as individuals in their homes and be able to feed their families and be healthy? How are they going to be able to sustain themselves and take their children to school? Those are the issues that we've really got out of this COVID issue. And also now we are trying to empower farmers, especially the women, and we are trying to create women groups, though we have them, but we are trying to put in more, instill in more. Like now, right now, my staff, my, one of my other, my colleagues went to the communities since yesterday, they are, right now they're in Northern Uganda and another batch is in Western Uganda. So we are trying to educate them how to improve on their post-harvest handling of these crops after, when, after the, the, the harvesting and also the storage. How are they going to access the markets? My organization is lucky that we've got a, a contract with World Food Program. We've, we had it and we thought they would not renew because of the COVID, but we are lucky that they've renewed they've renewed and uh, we're just waiting for the implementation period once the lockdown is out. So what I want to thank everyone here is that you brought on the great submissions that are really educative and they bring an insight onto me that which I'm going to carry forward in my organization and uh, make our, our work easier and better for our farmers. That's my submission. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you very much, Juliet. Uh, you have highlighted a very important thing. Uh, I, I, I want to just uh, bring back uh, issues of, uh, of job laws. Uh, for those who work with the government, they are automatically enrolled for pension retirement. But then when you look at uh, our staff whom we are laying them off at the moment, they, they, they literally have nothing to go back home with. In terms of, uh, in Uganda, we have National Social Security Fund that uh, yeah. is uh, um, a basket for organizations that are not under the government. And that this is a critical time for most people who are under this scheme. And of course, mm, uh, Civil society are advocating that uh, this money should be released to support those who are getting out, who are being laid off. But then they are still doing a lot of debate on how to change also issues of policy comes in. Because if they are to use what the policy in place in how to release this fund, at the moment it's not applicable, it doesn't work. And we pray that this work out so that we are able to get uh, something. And then secondly, uh, uh, protecting local uh, uh, local farmers. This is a very important thing, but also not just local. At a national level, Uganda, uh, the, the leaders at national level need to also work hard. Somebody talked so much about coffee, which is, he, he mentioned beautiful things, summarized all the things that we've been talking about. But then he talked a lot about coffee. But then how about this food crop? We have very good food crops that can be also taken abroad. And in exchange, we need to depend on one another basing on what we produce best. And Uganda is an agricultural country, a country that does a lot of agriculture and above all organic food. And how can we take this advantage to ensure that not only coffee can be marketed abroad, even these local products that we have here reach abroad so that we are able to boost our 
uh, local economy. And then when we look at some of our, in Uganda, we have food and beverages. And in this case, we have alcohol. Uganda is one country that drinks a lot of alcohol. And beautiful enough, uh, Anthony, uh, we have changed our alcohol into unsanitizer. <laughs> <laughs> no one is now drinking alcohol, I hope, though they still, but it is still illegal. So these are creativity that we see coming up. And things like alcoholism is something that we never thought in Uganda that there could be a mechanism to reduce consumption of alcohol. All major majority of, of people, women who suffer, children who suffer from domestic violence uh, because of alcoholism. And this is a big policy issue that this country, civil society organization, NGOs and CBOs should really see that there should be a better way that we can deal with issues of alcoholism in our areas. Because otherwise, uh, we've already found a way that people can live without alcohol. People can can find another way of Im improving their lives without, you know, getting into this dangerous, uh, you know, drinks that uh, has never helped them to get. And then in Northern Uganda, as I talk now, Joyce talk about locusts, but we have a different kind of, uh, it's not different, it looks like locusts. And in our language, we call it a billing. It is destroying crops. And this is something that is emerging up and a lot of crops have been destroyed already, uh, you know, uh, by this. And uh, this issue affects um, all range of areas, but above all, well, we need to join hand and then ask Cody family to ensure that, uh, like already we have not had contact uh, physical contact, maybe like uh, meeting all these participants physically. And then also I don't have your email address, but then uh, all addresses. But then I see that this is an opportunity that we can exploit to come together again, even if after this, we start to do something. Uh, the last speaker mentioned something very important about dependency not about community alone, yeah. even has civil society organization, uh, NGOs, local NGOs and CBOs. We are too much dependent on international organizations. And if we see how much this has affected them, we should now rethink on how to proceed. Issues of doing things that are sustainable should be our focus at this moment so that we get away from depending on external donation but use our locally available resources to ensure that we reach community. And then yeah. at the national level, for those who work with local government or at a higher level, we have local NGOs, we have CBOs in the country, and they are based in the community that we can reach. This is a time that uh, um, N NGOs or international organization, national organization and the government need to support these organizations that are working at the grassroots. Because this is the only way we can realize the impact of every drop we put in our community. But in many cases, we see that uh, international organization getting in, national big organization getting in, living down the local NGOs that should be the one who knows the context, who knows the issues, who knows one by one those who are affected and how to support them. So this should be a high opener to us to ensure that we use our locally available resources and take the message always to our community that we have land, we have things that you don't have to buy to in, in, in any case to earn income. The most important thing is to make them the awareness, the understanding on how to use these locally available resources and the skills available and the skills and knowledge available so that they are brought together to make a difference in society. So this is my submission to everyone. I hope this is my conclusion as well, but I want to say thank you very much to Cody team, Cody family. I love Cody. And I, I hope I'll come back again. And then <laughs> my fellow Ugandans, 
<laughs> to fellow Ugandans, thank you very much for all your contribution. You've made beautiful contribution that uh, I, I, I have to just sit down and assemble them and see how to move on with my organization, my community, my family, and uh, Uganda as a country. For God and my country. <laughs> Dear. Thank you very much, Grace. That was uh, that was lovely. Um, uh, I do see we have one one last hand up from a participant who hasn't spoken yet. So, Rabina, would you like really? to think? Would you like to add something, Rabina? Hello. Hello. Hello, Rabina. I'm sorry. I'm not seeing your hand. I've not been seeing people raise hand. <laughs> All right. So this is a last uh, last uh, but quick. Uh, input from Abina and then we'll wrap it up. So go ahead, Rabina. Yeah. Oh, your, uh, your microphone is off, I'm afraid to say at the moment. At least it says so on mine. Uh, Kate, can we help her open up her microphone? Can you hear me now? We can hear you fine, Yeah, Rabina. we can hear you. Yes, I say uh, what what I want to, much that I wanted to say. Grace has summarized it, but uh, I want to appreciate uh, that she had to we had to organize this forum as uh, to, to to put us together as Ugandan Cody graduates. Uh, we have a lot going on because of this crisis but getting to know how uh, people are going out and uh, helping, it, is, it, is, it helps. Personally, I work with children, but I've had very, very good submissions that will help me also um, know how to, to handle some things. And I would kind of request uh, Grace, I don't know how we can share our email addresses, our contacts, phone contacts, that at one time we come together, we, we uh, even not on Zoom, we, we, we call, we communicate, we share ideas. Because we are the people on ground, we have to do this. Otherwise, uh, find a way of uh, solving problems for ourselves, not really thinking of, of donations and, and, and such. So I'm so grateful for this forum, and I hope we shall come again and do it. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, Rabina. Okay, um, let's just uh, wrap it up. It's been well over two hours. Kate, can we just go back to the last slide or so? Um, I just want to uh, thank you all for, for uh, coming here. We've lost a few uh, participants along the way, and there were other people who registered, uh, um, uh, but, uh, but were not able to join us for whatever reason. But really, I must say, uh, I've been on seven or eight of these conversations, and um, uh, the quality of the inputs that uh, came from this group were really quite remarkable in terms of the stories that you've told, the challenges that you're facing, and the actions that you're, you're taking. So it's really quite, uh, quite uh, compelling. Um, so I'd like to thank you all for this uh, very much. Um, I think the, uh, uh, what we will do is uh, we'll, uh, we'll uh, share the link to the recording um, of this, um, uh, can you go back one, uh, Kate? Uh, so we'll um, uh, we'll uh, we'll do that if we can. Um, there there are privacy laws in Canada that restrict us being able to send out every a list of everybody's emails, but we can certainly do a follow up with individuals, and if they say. Uh, yes, we can. Uh, no, that's not quite. <laughs> you, now we're seeing your 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 screen, uh, Kate. Um, uh, there we go. That's all we wanted. Um, uh, so we, but we can certainly follow up. You'll get a follow up note about the recording of this note. You'll get a follow up uh, in terms of a bit of an evaluation questionnaire, um, and then we will. Um, all, we're in the process of documenting uh, the experiences and the lessons learned. So hopefully, if you're following. Uh, the Cody Facebook page, uh, you'll, you'll see this uh, material coming through. I mean, I think the point that I'd like to make in closing 
um, is, is one that's been made already, which is, is this just another crisis or is this a, a transformative uh, moment? Um, as, uh, as Joseph said, uh, you know, we, we're, we're trying to uh, figure out, are we just adjusting to the operational short term? And I think many of us believe that no, in fact, this is a, a transformative moment and we have to be thinking not just the short term, but also what are the law implications for the middle term and longer term? Because when life gets back to normal, uh, it will not be the old normal. It will most likely be a new normal, and we have to figure out what that's going to look like. And to be honest, we're engaged in that process at the Cody Institute. What does it mean for us if it's very problematic for people to travel internationally? How are we going to do our programs? Are we going to do a lot more uh, on Zoom and a lot less in the classroom? Uh, how do we try to maintain our connection with our graduates, who, as you say, are the people on the front line who are doing the work and who are, uh, you know, or who are uh, doing the learning and, are, and really have a lot of experiences and lessons learned to share? So without any further ado, I would like to say a huge word of thank you, um, first of all, to, uh, to Grace for agreeing to uh, pull together the group in Uganda and, and to moderate and co-facilitate this conversation. I'd like to thank Kate, who's been doing all the magic behind the scenes with the slides and the audio and everything. And uh, I would like most of all to thank all of you, the participants who joined us, those of you who are still here, those who have uh, left a little earlier, um, and yes, let indeed, let's indeed uh, keep in touch. We will try to support you as best we can from Andy Ganesh. Um, and we encourage you to uh, network as best you can. And if you're doing something, invite us in. If it's via Zoom or anything like this, we're always, always uh, interested to hear from, uh, um, from alumni in terms of the work that you're doing. So thank you very much indeed, everybody. Take care, stay healthy, stay safe, um, and we will be in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. 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 Carol. Bye. On your phone. Bye. No cafe. We are coming for coffee. No, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that coffee. Yeah, we're coming for coffee. <laughs> Should I join you? Uh, okay. is your number? New cafe, uh, uh, yeah. my new. We have got, we have got, uh, we have got uh, a, a very nice uh, coffee maker from Canada. Very good. And we want to start making coffee in uh, our gift center. Very good. So, uh, yeah, so I, I really need your contact and see how you can. A very, uh, it's an automatic uh, coffee maker that uh, will attract a lot in, uh, in terms of fundraising for the women because it is in the women's center. So we've not started using this machine, but we hope it is one way the women can generate income locally. Very good. I, I, I have put my email on the chat. Yeah. I have written my email, and the, if you can take down my telephone number. Yes, please. Uh, WhatsApp number 0703. 0703-59-59-50. 50, 30, 30, then still MTN0772. Okay.